little anxiety producing when your friends have to introduce you? Because <laughs> you never quite know what they're going to say. And they usually say something that puts a lot of pressure on the preacher, so <laughs> I'm just going to come in my own way, as the old folks say. And now that I am an old folks, I get to say it. I am happy to be back at MCC Detroit. I always have a good time when I'm with you, and so thank you for inviting me to come back. Uh, and thank you to Brian and Roland and others who thought it was appropriate for me to sit on it. <laughs> I appreciate your care. I do want to send a special shout out to Belinda and Mal who are here this morning. Uh, Belinda and I met freshman year of high school and we just commemorated 50 years of graduate since we graduated so we've known each other for over 50 years and it's not I mean, it's a real blessing to have had a friend that long. Amen. And so I am really happy that you're here this morning. And what can I say about Pastor Roland? <laughs> I think the last time I was here, I told you the story that I actually heard about him before I actually met him. Uh, he was coming to work on his master's degree in divinity at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. And the admissions director probably started talking about this student maybe three or four months before he arrived. And she was going on and on about the student who was coming from Fort Wayne and how he got all his paperwork in and, uh, you know, his essay was just brilliant and how they expected him to do great things um, at PSR. So when I met him, I was the director of community life, and so I was coordinating new student orientation. So he walked up to me, or I walked up to him, and he said, I'm Roland Stringfellow. And all I could, all I could do before I even thought about it was, oh, so you're Roland Stringfellow. <laughs> and little did I know that almost 20 years later, Amen. we would still be connected. That's my brother. That's my friend. And I'm always happy to be in your presence. So thank you for the invitation to be here. Our topic for this morning, I want to thank Brian and the choir also for your ministry of music. It really um, moves me and prepares me to worship. So I thank you and the choir. Our topic for this morning is what's love got to do with it? Whenever we hear this question, we immediately think of Tina Turner's signature song. <laughs> or at least we ought to. <laughs> Released in 1984, Tina Turner was 44 years old when the song hit number one. At the time, she was the oldest female solo artist to place a number one song on the U.S. Hot 100. It remains her only number one hit, and it revived her musical career. In this song, Turner plays the part of a woman who enjoys the carnal encounters with her lover, but feels no emotional attachment. She wants him to know that there's nothing more to it. For her, it's purely physical. Their relationship has nothing to do with love, which she dismisses as a sweet, old-fashioned notion. It became the anthem for everyone who had ever experienced heartbreak and was determined never to love again, believing that loving only brought pain. It's really an anti-love song, and Tina Turner hated it. She didn't want to record it and only did so at the insistence of her manager, Roger Davies, who was her, who was engineering her first solo, uh, when he was engineering her comeback after she left Ike Turner. And he was sure the song would be a hit. In my mind, it's her song, no matter who else might sing it. This song belongs to Tina Turner. She may not have loved the song, 
but the song sure did love her. <laughs> you just never know, do you? Likewise, our passage from Luke is a familiar one to Christians and non-religious folk alike. It is a compelling story that has all the elements of great drama, conflict, bandits, wounded victims, plot twists, unlikely protagonists, and a call to action. We are drawn to the story as it invites us to be part of it. Preachers and Sunday school teachers both have taught the moral of the story. Be like the Good Samaritan. The robbers, bad. The priest, bad. The Levite, bad. The Samaritan, good. Good people help others in need. The sense of moral obligation to others is such a strong value, it's been incorporated into secular life and law. All 50 states of the Union have some kind of Good Samaritan policy, although the conditions and expectations will vary from place to place. Yet the bottom line is that decent folks are expected to help others in need. Mm -hmm. Christian folks are expected to do that even more because helping people is both a civic and a religious and moral duty. Now, many of us want to believe that we would be the Good Samaritan if we were in the story. We are trained to see ourselves as the hero or heroine. We don't want to believe that we might avoid those who need our help, not like the priest and the Levite. We don't want to see the ways that we ambush each other as the robbers do in the story. I know that doesn't happen here at MC Center. <laughs> Perhaps we would prefer to be the innkeeper, the one who plays a part in caring for the person in need without being the one who takes the risk. Mm -hmm. Now I want us to take a step back from the story so that we can get a little bit of the backstory like we did in Sunday school this morning. <laughs> the lawyer was there in the crowd to ask a question. And a lawyer in those days was simply one who uh, had studied the Torah and understood what the Law of Moses was all about to help the people live in community. And he was there to see if Jesus would give a right answer or not. What must I do to inherit eternal life, he asked. Notice that it is a do question, not a be question. It's not even a believe question. Like Jesus, he was raised on Torah, which is about how to live and not what to believe. His question concerns practice and not belief. He wants Jesus to tell him in plain language what kind of life he, sh he should be living now in order to live in God's presence forevermore. It's not a bad question even if it is a test. This was a question that people of those days, no matter what their class of social standing, they were concerned about what was going to happen to them when they died, because they certainly lived fearful lives at that time. And they wanted to do whatever they could to ensure that they would make it to heaven. Jesus asked him what the law said, even though they both knew what was written in the law. Jesus wants to hear from his own mouth what he thinks, and he's not disappointed. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, the lawyer says, and your neighbor as yourself. In Luke's gospel, the lawyer gives the summary of the law, not Jesus. Jesus just stands there quietly waiting to hear what he would say. The lawyer's answer combines two passages, one from the book of Deuteronomy and the other one from the book of Leviticus. Jesus loves his response because it's almost word for word what he says in the Gospel of Mark. You have given the right answer, Jesus says. Do this and you will live. Now this should have been where the conversation ends. Question asked, 
question answered. Mm -hmm. Keep it moving, dude. <laughs> Relationship with God extends outward towards one's neighbor. The Hebrew Bible teaches that and Jesus teaches that just <coughs> But the lawyer asks another question, a deeper question, one not so easy to answer. Who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. Now that's not an unreasonable question. Do we count as neighbor those who are in close proximity? Mm -hmm. Do we count as neighbor only those who look like us or who believe as we do? What should we do for our neighbor? How much is enough? How much is too much? What are the limits of what we should do? And instead of giving a direct answer to an earnest question, Jesus tells a story. Now we are not surprised that someone had been robbed on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. That happened a lot in those days, despite the Roman efforts to make it safer. But what does surprise us, or should surprise us, is what happens next. Now remember, this was before the days of cell phones and 911 and regular highway patrols. Yeah, yeah. A priest comes along the road, a religious leader who could quote scripture, who could quote the Hebrew prophets, who challenged people to live the commands to love God, to do kindness, to work for justice, and to walk humbly with God, who reminded the people that they were keepers of one another. But the priest walked on by. Not what we expect. Not from the one who preaches and teaches the Torah. Then a Levite comes along, a religious layperson who no doubt had heard sermon after sermon about caring for others, about going the extra mile for a sister or a brother, about <coughs> welcoming the stranger, about sharing a meal with those who have no food. But the Levite walked on by. Not what we would expect from one who hears and follows the truth. And then the scripture says, but a Samaritan comes along and our expectations go way down because nothing good could be said about the Samaritans. They were outsiders to Jews with their own absurd notion that God could be worshipped anywhere. Samaritans did not see the temple in Jerusalem as the seat and the home of God. The Samaritans, with their liberal notion that God actually loves all people, we cannot trust Samaritans or their so-called religions. The Jews would say that the Samaritans were the ones who really needed to be cast away. Yet it is the Samaritan who gets close enough to determine whether the yeah. victim was still alive. Close enough to empathize with him. Close enough to clean his wounds with oil and wine. Close enough to get him to shelter and pay for his room and board. Close enough to pay the innkeeper to keep him safe until he could return. Not what we expect. We are as shocked as the listeners of Jesus were. The priest and the Levi pass by, restricted by their religious systems, and we are aware that godly institutions will often keep us from seeing whom Jesus sees, from helping those whom God desires us to help. It's like bakers who refuse to bake a wedding cake for same-sex couples. It's like county clerks who defy federal law by refusing to issue marriage licenses to same-gender-loving people. Both cite their religious beliefs as legitimate reasons. They glibly say that God condones traditional marriages between one man and one woman. 
They say that the Bible created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Mm -hmm. But they completely ignore the tr that traditional marriage does not exist in the Bible as we have. Uh -huh. Abraham fathers children with Sarah and his servant Hagar. Jacob marries Rachel and her sister Leah, as well as their servants Bilhah and Zilpah. That yes, there is Adam and Eve, but there is also Naomi and Ruth and Jonathan and David. Sometimes our religion, or at least our interpretation of the scripture, keeps us from seeing what God sees. The celebration of love and commitment, the willingness and desire to build strong relationships and families of all kinds. A priest, a Levite, a Samaritan, a victim of robbers, an innkeeper, who are you in this story? Who are you in this parable? The priest and the Levite pass on by trudging dutifully into the distance. They are too busy to help, too tied to their work that they have yet to do, preoccupied with the next thing on their to-do list. Jesus doesn't blame them for doing nothing. He does not accuse them of cold-heartedness. They quite reasonably keep their distance and we watch them and we judge them in ways that Jesus does not. We are smug knowing that we would never walk by. <laughs> we know who our neighbor is. And we are sure that we would do better than the priest and the Levite. We've already done better. We give to charitable organizations. We send money to support starving children in Africa and abused animals across this country. <laughs> we recycle our cans and our bottles and we take cloth bags to the grocery store to reduce our reliance on plastic. We do what we can to reduce our carbon footprint. We give a dollar or two to the beggar sitting on cardboard whose sign says she is a homeless veteran. Now my intention, my friends, is not to be glib or dismissive of our humanitarian efforts. They are needed and they are meaningful and they can make a world of difference for somebody. In our hope that we are the good Samaritans, we emphasize the good part. Our intentions are honorable, and that counts for something. Yet we forget the Samaritan part. Mm -hmm. To be a Samaritan is to be an outsider. Mm -hmm. And it was the Samaritan, a religious outcast, a social outcast, and from the very group that has already rejected Jesus a chapter earlier in the Gospel of Luke, it is the Samaritan who has stepped outside of his kin and his people to help someone not like himself. The Samaritan breaks all protocol by stopping to help a Jew. The lawyer in a in the encounter with Jesus was prepared to be scandalized by the Samaritan not to praise him. So he comes near. If there is a moral or physical danger involved in coming near, he ignores it. If there are ancient hostilities between their people, the Samaritan disregards them. If there are great gaps between their understandings of God that might cause them to begin arguing and fighting with one another the moment the half-dead man arrives, the Samaritan figures he'll deal with that later. If he comes near the man, which is what puts him in, that's what puts him in the dead man half-dead man's neighborhood. He comes near enough to see him, near enough to be moved to pity and mercy, near enough to offer a helping hand. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? You know the right answer. 
because you have heard this story more times than you can count. But if you too wish to know what you must do to inherit eternal life, the answer becomes flesh right here, come near. It's what God does in Christ. It's where the kingdom, the realm of God is near. Coming near is God's specialty act. Amen. And Jesus flows from that. Yeah. The Samaritan breaks protocol to give life to the great commandment. I suspect we have no problem with the first part. We love God deeply. We strive to love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our strength, with all our minds. After all, that's one of the reasons why we come to church to worship and adore the one who created us in that one's image and likeness. All of us, each of us, Adam, Eve, Steve, Naomi, Ruth, David, Jonathan, Roland, Brian, Jerry. We gather to, repeat, to be reminded that we are wonderfully made. Yes just a little lower than the angels. LGBTQAI and straight. God loves us fiercely, completely, without limits or conditions. Black, white, Latin, X, Asian, Native American, mixed. We gather in community to sing the songs of Zion, to strengthen us for the journey that attacks our humanity, our dignity, our very existence. We gather to think about who we are and what we do collectively to serve our God. It is the second part of the great command that trips some of us up. It's that loving the neighbor thing. I believe that Jesus tells his parable to shake up his listeners and us. The power of Jesus' parables is that we can read them over and over and over and always find something new and challenging. And for me, some days, even terrifying in what it asks of us. Who is my neighbor? If we were to ask the one who got beat up in a shelter last night who her neighbor is, what would her answer be? If we ask the one who was arrested and shot for a busted tail light mm -hmm. who his neighbor is, we wonder what the question will be. Mm -hmm. If we ask the nearly 6,000 children separated from their parents at the southern border who their neighbor is, I wonder what the answer would be. And while you're at it, ask those children who are still in cages who their neighbor is. Ask the transgender youth who experiences family rejection, bullying, and harassment, who feels unsafe for simply being who they are, who their neighbor is, I wonder what they would say. Ask our Muslim sisters and brothers who are maligned as terrorists who their neighbor is. Ask the coal miners who were dismissed from their job without severance who their neighbor is. Ask the ones in experiencing increased human trafficking, mm -hmm. racial gender identity yeah, bias, yeah. and anti-transgender violence who their neighbor is. Ask the poor, the mm -hmm. suicidal, mm -hmm. the homeless, the sick among us who their neighbor is. Ask the middle class, those of means and resources, the wealthy, the powerful who their neighbor is. Mm -hmm. Each will give a different answer. Now, as we think about who we are in this parable, I suspect that many of us feel like that hapless victim in the parable, at least for a time or two, stripped, beaten, left for dead, if not physically, then certainly symbolically. I know I have. You're not like those other blacks. You're so articulate. Can I touch your hair? When I have hair. <laughs> I shared with the Sunday school class.
class, I had an incident at the hotel this morning as I was waiting for the elevator, an older white man with a cap on came, and I, I didn't know, you know, I'm just being aware that he was there, and he said, good morning, and I said, good morning, and he said, man, it sure is cold out there, and we went on to have a lovely conversation, just telling me that he was glad he was here instead of Abilene, Texas, where they got snow yeah. yesterday, um, so you just never know, but... You know, you have to be aware. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I am still, in 2019, either the only woman or the only African American at a table. Mm -hmm. Every day, my dignity gets chipped away by people who don't know me, who don't care about me, and don't care to learn about me. Yeah. I wonder about you. Have you ever felt ignored? Has your voice ever been silenced? Has your existence ever been questioned, pushed aside, ignored? Well, the good news is that we're still here. Amen. You and I, we're still here. On purpose, for a purpose. God has blessed us to be here, yeah. battered maybe, but we are still blessed. And we are called to be a blessing to someone else. Someone who has been a neighbor to us. Someone has been a neighbor to us and we are challenged to be a neighbor to someone else. Not because we're trying to earn eternal life, but we are neighbors out of gratitude for the neighborliness that we have experienced from God through Jesus our Lord. It's called passing it on. As far as we know, Jesus was not discriminated against because of his sexuality or his gender identity or race or immigration status or physical or mental capacity, economic or social status. But he knows a whole lot about danger and safety, selfishness and generosity, loneliness and community, fear and faith, forsakenness and compassion. He knew how the movement of pity and mercy was confined and channeled only to the people that we know and only to those who could return the favor. He was very attuned to a world where people walk on by as quietly and discreetly as possible. Yet he invited his listeners to imagine whether that movement of pity and mercy might open us up to humanity, to the stranger, where we will get more than we ever bargained for. Whether the powerful bond of love and obligation and duty might also tie us together across all those lines that are designed to keep us separated. In an increasingly global neighborhood, we are confronted with the question, what's love got to do with it? When there are so many changes happening that we neither welcome or, nor can we contain them, might we dare move beyond the second emotion, the second hand emotion, to something that is real and deep and risky? The most compelling thing about the Samaritan in this parable is that he stopped and he drew near, near enough to see, to feel, to recognize a neighbor as someone who needed a neighbor badly, near enough to help at his own expense of time and money, near enough outside of his comfort zone where he made a difference where he embodied love. Jesus told the lawyer to be, that he answered well, that the neighbor is the one who showed mercy. Jesus told him to go and do likewise. Mm -hmm. Do we dare to draw near to those who are different from us? Do we dare move outside our comfort zone? Do we dare cross those boundaries of race, class, ethnicity, gender 
identity, sexual orientation, language, and color. Our society is in the midst of a constitutional crisis right now. And it affects the lives of so many people as we watch policies being rolled back and it feels like we're stepping back in time. I don't know what your politics are, but I think I know what Jesus might say to us today were he alive in flesh and blood. And I know this because I remember that inaugural sermon that he preached in his hometown synagogue <laughs> where he was asked to bring a word for the morning. And Jesus stood up and he unrolled the scroll and he read from the book of Isaiah and he yes. said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for I have been anointed to preach and to bring good news to the poor. I've been sent to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the favor of God. Jesus tells a story. What's love got to do with it? He tells a story. And I would imagine that if he were here today, he'd tell a story that would be summed up on a meme that I saw on Facebook. Yes, there are some good things on Facebook. <laughs> and the meme said, and I believe that this is what Jesus would say to us, vote as if your skin is not white. Whoa. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. So this one, this one. Your parents need medical care. Mm, right. Your friend is a missing indigenous woman. Mm. Your spouse is an immigrant. Mm. Your land is on fire. Mm. Your son is transgender. Mm. Your house is flooded. Your sister is a victim of gun violence. Your brother is gay. Your water is unsafe. Your daughter is a sexual assault survivor. That's how we ought to be voting. That's, right. mm -hmm. That's how we ought to be living. Mm -hmm. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Mm -hmm. Love God with your total self, your total being, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? All who need help. Anyone yes. who is on yes. the margin. Yes. For it is at the margin that we will meet God. My friends, what does love have to do with it? Everything. God wants us to know that love is all there is when all is said and done. Love is all there is when it's all said and done. I pray you have the courage, the strength, and the faith to go and do likewise. Lord God, may it be so. Amen.